It's the Built-In Black America podcast. Today, we're getting ourselves into a jam. But I promise it's the kind that you'll like. Hey, folks, I'm Larry McGill. Thanks for joining me on the journey. I'm talking with Ashley Rouse. She's the owner and CEO of Trade Street Jam Company. We're going to talk about how she took hundreds of recipes and narrowed them down into six flavors that are pleasing palates across the country. But first, I've got to give you the rundown. If you look at the website for Trade Street Jam Company, they let you know up front they're not your average jam. Owner Ashley Rouse isn't just sticking with normal boring flavors like grape and strawberry. She's adding chipotle and figs to those strawberries among half a dozen flavors. All of them beckon you to join a nationwide jamily. Ashley told us how she got it all started from her apartment. Ashley Rouse, thanks for joining me on the Built-in Black America podcast. Thanks so much for having me. All right, so I want to get right into it. Ashley, tell me what you were doing right before you started uh, Trade Street Jam Company. Uh, I was working. (laughs) I've always worked in the food service business. I was actually working in the World Trade Center for Restaurant Associates and Condé Nast, and I was running the, like, Instagram, the marketing, helping out, like, with the menu writing, and, yeah, doing what I did best, which was work in food. All right, so you were working in food, but what made you want to go make jam? I've always kind of jammed. Uh, I've always liked preserving and canning and more as a hobby. And so it was something I was doing long ago. And back in 2008, I lived in this apartment on Trade Street. And, you know, I had this vision, like one day I'll make a jam company and I'll call it Trade Street Jam Co. And so I think you know, in 2016, I kind of just revisited that idea and started jamming again, just as something to do after work, you know, keep me busy, and then just started selling it on the side. And then here we are today. So talk to me about what it looked like in your house when you were making your first sets of jams for sale, like in your kitchen or your living room. What kind of setup did you have in there? Oh, gosh, what a hot mess. And I was also running another entrepreneurial venture on the side. I was doing this company called Urban Mondays and I was doing custom alterations. I've been sewing for uh, 10 years. I think I haven't in a while, but I took lessons and just did it for a long time. So with this business, people would like send in jeans or jean jackets or just pieces of clothing. And we would kind of like trick them out. We would turn them into joggers or sew on patches, like really fun. So I was like, I had this room and like half of it was the tiniest room, by the way, you know, a Brooklyn apartment. So, so tiny. Um, But half of the room was filled with scraps of fabric and sewing machines and scissors and all the things. And then the other side of the room um, was all these like mason jars and little labels that I was like handwriting the flavors on. And it was a mess. And, And I was making small batches at the time of only 20 or 30 jars or so. So, you know, it was manageable, but gosh, it was a tiny space. Were you taking them to like multiple uh, farmers markets or or street markets or where were you taking them to? I was mainly selling on Etsy. Okay. So that was kind of the route I was going. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do like the markets, but I thought I was, you know, not prepared for that. I think I looked at these different markets. We would go to them on the weekends and I thought they were so, so cool. And I was like, oh, man, one day, like, when they would accept me, I would love to be there. And it's just funny because, you know, once I started doing markets, I never stopped. And I did them straight every month, every weekend for, like, three years. So it's kind of funny looking back. Checking out your website, it looks like you have some signature flavors there now. But what were some of the first flavors that you came up with when you were first starting to sell your jams? So the strawberry that we have now is one of the ones that have been around since inception, which is cool. It's always that popular. But some of the flavors from the beginning, I can't even remember. We had this funny thing that we were doing. It's funny now, right? But I would create these flavors. And then once we sold out of the small batch, I wouldn't bring it back. I would like retire that flavor. Um, and so it would kind of, you know, drive this cool demand. Like people were like, oh man, if I don't get it today, like, you know, I won't see it again. And I laughed because I had no idea it was like the least sustainable way to run a business ever. Uh, but I had no idea at the time. So I can't even remember what flavors are doing. I mean, I'm, I must've gone through hundreds of flavors. So you got like half a dozen there now, but you potentially have hundreds in your back pocket that you could still be making. Oh, yeah. I have a like a note in my iPhone with probably 500 flavors of just like different ideas that have popped in my head and I wrote down. Oh, my goodness. So back then, did you call it Trade Street Jam Company or was it just like Ashley's Jams? No, no, definitely called it Trade Street 
definitely wanted it to look really modern and cool and professional and not be like, I I didn't want this like homemade vibe. I just wanted to look like a real business, you know? When you first got started, how did you make sure that everything was up to the quality that you wanted to be? Well, I mean, you know, it was such small batches. So I was able to taste everything and I was really easily able to control like where the produce was coming from and I mean I still can now but you know it was just such a small batch that it was just so easy to have a close hand on everything so I tasted everything you know I made it with love and it was all done by hand done by me so you know the quality was always there. So everything's done by you by hand at first but at some point you know you got to make that expansion at what point did you decide to make that expansion? And tell me about what your operation looks like now versus what it looked like uh, back in the day. Oh, man, it's so funny because I was like doing this in my kitchen and it, it was just annoying. You know, it, it started to be too much. And my husband was like, oh, yeah, you know, you're going to have to go to like one of those shared kitchens. And I'm like, ha, yeah, right. Like, how are we going to afford that? And then probably like six months later, I was in a shared kitchen. And then, and, you know, I think we did that for maybe a year and then about maybe six or eight months into that my husband said like this is grueling like you're gonna have to get a co-packer and I'm like ha someone make this for us how are we gonna afford that and then a few months later we had a co-packer so it's funny we always try to prepare in advance for things even if I didn't feel like I was ready for them so when my husband first said he needed a shared kitchen I started doing the research I put together a document which is also funny that I share this now with so many budding entrepreneurs in the CPG space, I'm like, oh, I have this document that compares all these shared kitchens, if that would help. And they're like, oh my God, yes, send it. But I created this so long ago, just trying to understand the pricing and see if I really could do it, even though I had no belief that I could. And then when it came time to get a shared kitchen, you know, I had already done the research. And so the same type of thing happened for the co-packer. You know, I, I didn't think we could afford it, but it sounded so great. So I did the research anyway. And bought some ebooks and like really tried to do the research on finding the right co-packer and when it was time to do so it just fell into place really smoothly so yeah I mean now our operations are obviously much bigger a pretty well-oiled machine but gosh there's always something but our gems are produced by our manufacturer in New Jersey and then we ship them to our 3PL in Pennsylvania who ships everything out and I mean, gosh, in the beginning, I was doing everything. And for a long time, even once we switched to the co-packer, I would go pick up the jam from the co-packer, bring it to the downstairs of my apartment where I had pretty much turned it into a little factory. And I would pick up, you know, as much jam as I could bring home, which was probably 10 cases of six SKUs and put them on this huge U-line shelf that we had built. And then I would package everything out of my apartment. And then like, you know, the postman would come pick up 30, 50 packages a day. And yeah, it was, it was miserable. It was, it was a lot. It actually was fine until last year when COVID hit and the Black Lives Matter. And there was this huge outpouring of support for black owned businesses. So a lot of the black owned brands, I know sales went up 300, 500, 800%. We were definitely one of those brands. And so I mean, to put things in perspective, I think in January, it was a slow month. We were doing like two grand in sales and June hit and we did 80 grand. And the good thing is, is that we had like the, you know, the operations we had, we had a system that was working. And so that's the really good thing. So we just had to kind of ramp everything up, but gosh, was it hard. And so even after you had already gone to a, a major production, your apartment was still looking like a, a shipping warehouse. I mean, it was. We actually have a pretty decent sized apartment for Brooklyn, which actually, uh-huh. you know, I'm so grateful for because we have a whole downstairs and it used to be like a living space with a couch and like our family could come stay, like pulled out to a bed. There was a huge shelf to the ceiling. It must have been 12 feet tall and it was full of all this heavy jam and I had hired some staff and they would help me one guy would help me unload the car with jam and put it on the shelf and then he and another girl would help me try to ship out 100 packages a day if we could and 
yeah, <laughs> it was a lot. Even after we had that, you know, it's funny because people always like see from the outside. They're like, man, like you guys are doing so great. And, you know, you have all this and you must have a warehouse. And it's like they have no idea that we're doing this behind the scenes in our apartment. <laughs> well, so for people that might be listening in the future, we're talking sort of on uh, almost on the backside of a pandemic. This time last year, pretty much the whole world was shut down. And now we're sort of starting to see the end of the tunnel. So now that things are slightly going somewhat back to normal, tell me what a day looks like for you when you get up and you've got things to do. I think it's so funny, you know, when people ask me that, because I'm like, gosh, every day is just like, it's so different or it can be crazy. But I guess on a regular day, I wake up, I try to pray so that I can get my mind right, because these days can just throw anything at you. And I spend time with my baby in the beginning of the day. It's just so, so important. I have a nine month old and she's still a new baby. And she just brings me more joy than I've ever experienced in my life. So I I spend so much time there because the business sometimes can be the opposite. It can be a, a drain on your energy, on your positivity. I mean, it can be really, really stressful and challenging at times. So I make sure to spend time with her and my husband and, and, you know, just kind of zen out in the morning. And then once I get going, I'm, you know, I'm answering hundreds of emails. I'm hopping on hopefully no more than like six or seven calls a day, Zooms and con calls and doing podcasts and interviews and trying to answer these emails in between and make sure everything operationally is good. So I'm communicating with my manufacturer throughout the day, logging into the portal of my 3PL and making sure inventory looks good and that orders are going out smoothly. I'm checking on wholesale orders with like bigger vendors and clients that we have. That's pretty much what I spend my day doing is just kind of running the operation. And then I do have a small team that I have begun to build. So I'm checking on them. You know, I'm usually having check-in calls with them or I'm texting with them and just trying to get some updates, make sure things are running smoothly. Are you able to keep them uh, sort of in a separate space or are they working with you in your apartment or uh, hopefully you're at least, you know, able to, to do that safely at this point. Everything is so virtual now. So, I mean, they're all virtual, you know, I have some videographers on the team who are creating content for me and I'm just like mailing them jam and they're creating the content and then they're like dropping it in a drive. So we have like video calls, but nobody works here. Like with me, my social media manager and marketing team, she's in Texas and she does a fantastic job. So I'm always checking in with her almost daily. Um, I have an email marketing girl who runs my newsletter and sets up my email campaigns and flows and she's great and she's in Arizona. So everyone's kind of spread around. Wow. So you've done a really good job of sort of outsourcing things that either you're not familiar with or you just don't want to have to bother with. It's more so that I just can't do everything. I mean, like, honestly, the Mm. social media portion and content creation is probably the most fun part of the business. So it's not that I don't want to do it. I mean, I used to spend so much time creating recipes and recipe testing and then taking pictures because I dabble in photography and I built the social media off of images that I took. And I used to love like that recipe testing. And it's like sad that now I I, like don't have the time to do any of that because that is the fun stuff. So some of it is stuff that I just don't have time to do. Some of it is to your point stuff that I just like, you know, my email marketing, like I can set up a basic newsletter, but gosh, I don't know how to set up flows and these welcome series and, and abandoned cart flows and things that are going to funnel customers back into the website, even after they're gone. And, you know, we have a bookkeeper and a CFO. So people that are helping with the financials, I mean, I'm so involved and I'm looking at those daily, but you still want somebody who has a a grasp on things to be kind of handling that. So if you don't mind, I want to go back to, you were talking about how much you love tasting and testing a whole lot of your products. If you can, I, I guess I won't say quickly, run down some of the flavors that you have right now that you really like and maybe the, some of the ones that are the biggest sellers. So our best sellers are the strawberry chipotle and fig, the blueberry lemon basil, and the smoked yellow peach. And those have been top sellers for a while. But actually, my, my favorite aren't even in that category. I love, love the plum and rose I have for years. It's just light. It's floral. It's romantic. It's tart. It's just such a beautiful jam. It goes great stirred into champagne. It's good slathered on a biscuit. You can make a vinaigrette with it. I have this recipe where we make these crispy Brussels and we toss it in this plum vinaigrette. It's so beautiful. So that's probably my my number one. And 
gosh, we have this sour cherry ginger that I love. It's like got chunks of fresh cherries in there and lots of vanilla bean. And then we have a blackberry mulled Merlot that I'm into and it has a ton of like red wine in it. And it's like a full bodied jam, which is really cool. So there's so much to choose from. I'm just going to put it out there. I'm already drawn to the Merlot one. Oh yeah. It's good. I love that one. <laughs> I love it. It does have like seeds in it because you get all this like fresh blackberries, right? So it's got some seeds, but the flavor is just so powerful and delicious. I mean, trust me, you, you'll love that one. So you've got half a dozen flavors out there. How did you settle on these six? The people spoke. We did all these events and that was one of the really great takeaways from doing all the events in person is that you get real-time feedback. You know, when people buy online, it's like, okay, well, most people are buying this. And then like, did they come back and buy it? I mean, it's all this data that you have to try to like sift through. But when you sell in person, you don't even need to like find data. It's right there in front of you. If every single time someone comes to the table, they ask to try the same two jams or they try all of them, but like something in their face, this twinkle in their eye when they try this strawberry chipotle and fig, it was things like that that kind of just told us early on, okay, this strawberry is a winner. So we're sticking with this one. And then so we'd always offer that. And then we would try, you know, a few more flavors. And then one was like, oh, it was great. But like people just weren't into it. Maybe they didn't get it. If they're not big foodies, they might be too weird for them or whatever. So we really just let like the our jamily like tell us what they loved. The jamily. I love that. It's it's on the website and I saw it. I was like, wow, she calls them the jamily. Yeah. I mean, that, that's already just <laughs> built in marketing right there. That's it. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one or two of the other things that I've also seen on your website. There's a cherry chipotle mocktail elixir. Tell me about this and tell me how you came up with it. So a couple different things kind of came together. The first thing, the major thing is that we make this really great sour cherry ginger jam and it has this like beautiful juice that we strain off of the jam that we can't do anything with. And so it's just really a great like sustainability practice to use that right to not throw it away so we had like gallons of this juice that we were just like kind of saving in the freezer and I'm like what are we going to do it's beautiful great fresh tart juice and then at the same time we're always making cocktails with our jams and so like our customers are really drawn to a lot of our cocktail recipes and then also like you know I'm big on food trends and like what's going on in the world and this whole like non-alcoholic trend is really rising right now with anything from these like zero proof non-alcoholic like liquor I guess you still call it that but it doesn't have any alcohol and then like mocktail mixes you know and so we really were just like well man like a mocktail elixir sounds really cool and it'd be a great way to use this cherry so we kind of asked our people what you would think of this and and we did a test batch of it a small run of maybe 50 bottles of it or something and they sold out within like a couple hours and so we started selling that we also sell some other funky things you know we have a biscuit mix and we actually are dropping a hot sauce very 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 soon so definitely you know I'm not sure when people will hear this but definitely check out the new hot sauce and we're doing a raspberry hot sauce and that is it's so fun it's pungent and tangy and it's it's great that is something I certainly didn't see coming, the whole hot sauce thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, our customers like spice. You know, they love our strawberry chipotle fig because it has some spice to it. And then hot sauce is just a, it's a popular thing, right? With sriracha and these chili crisps and anything spicy is just kind of cool. And I'm a big condiment person. And that's kind of where some of this stuff comes from. It's just like, I love sauces. I love stuff you can put on other stuff. So this hot sauce is cool on pizza, on noodles, on a grilled cheese, in a cocktail, like all these really funky, crazy things. And so I'm into it. See, I was just going to ask, one of the things that really has struck me in doing the research is, you know, you don't just suggest people put this on their morning toast or something like that. You've got all these great other uses for all these different jams. Tell me what's the most unique thing that either you've come up with or that you've heard somebody come up with that they put one of your jams on. I mean, that's harder for me to say just because I'm a chef. And so it takes a lot for me to be like, oh, what, really? But one does come to mind, and this is from a few years ago, but someone bought our smoked peach jam, and I think they emailed me or something, and they said that it is the most perfect addition to their mom's 
famous meatloaf recipe. And so I, I thought that was cool because they were like, this has changed this recipe, like for the history of the recipe now. And it's cool because, yeah, I love when people like bring their family into it or they, you know, they say it's nostalgic or reminds them of something. I think that's really cool. But I was also like, man, it makes sense, of course. Like the peach jam's great on any meat. So it makes sense. But I just had never at that point heard it being used in meatloaf. And so I think that's a really cool use. But gosh, I mean, this is good on steak. It's good on roasted veggie. It's good as a salad dressing. It's good in any cocktail. I mean, there's so many fun things. It's good on pizza. You know, I make a flatbread with the strawberry chipotle steak jam and put prosciutto and fresh mozzarella or burrata cheese or even blue cheese and just like bake in the oven. And it's amazing. So there's so many different things. So within the past year or so, we've seen this really big push for social, racial, political change in the United States. Within that change, there's this push to buy black, to support more black businesses. But the more I talk to black business owners, the more that I hear from them that the majority of their customers aren't even from the black community. So tell me how important you think it is. Tell me where you think you would be if you could get the black community to step up and support not just your business, but, you know, black businesses in general. Well, gosh, like I think we would be even further along on the path to creating generational wealth. Because, you know, there's so many other like races and communities, even look here in New York, like Jewish communities. I mean, they've run the city and it's awesome because they put their dollars back into their own community. And you don't see that with black people. You just don't. And I don't know if we'll ever see it in that way in my lifetime, but it's beginning. But I think it's so important. I think it's important that we support our own people. It's equally as important that other races are supporting us as well, because, you know, we need support from everywhere. But I do think that, like, it's very powerful when your own culture is behind you and backs you. And so I think it's something that has to happen and that we have to do a better job of. And I don't want it to be something that's a trend. And, um, you know, a lot of it does feel trendy and it makes me sad you know we got so much outreach from like not just like black owned businesses but like also from like food networks and from the new york times and all these great publications and all these articles but you know i i couldn't help but think then and i think it now is is it over now you know some of these people have still reached out for like mother's day articles and it's great it's like cool we're still top of mind but again i just want to make sure this is not a trend you know we're here to stay and I believe we're the biggest category of entrepreneurs, of people creating businesses. And so, you know, it's a it's a big deal. And I take it if it ends up being sort of a trendy kind of thing, it makes it harder on you to plan into the future because you're just not sure about what you can expect. I mean, it's funny you say that because it's kind of what I'm going through now. It's like, you know, I feel like sales are really slow right now. And it's just funny because, you know, I talk to people on my team and we pull up reports and we compare now to this time last year and they're like what do you mean slow and it's so hard because it's like you know if we have like a I don't know if we have a $30,000 month it might feel slow right but then like last year this time we had a $5,000 month and so it's just funny because well it's slow in comparison to the last eight months you know you can see that trendiness in your sales right um you can see that oh man, we had this big boom and now it's kind of trailing off and you're hoping that you retain those customers that they didn't just buy because they're like, oh, where can I buy black? Anything, anything I can, I'm just going to buy black. But you're hoping that they actually was like, man, that was actually really, really great and I'm going to continue to be a customer of theirs. But you definitely have people that you'll never see again. Also, the you know the George Floyd thing was kind of like a perfect storm. I want to say once in a lifetime, but unfortunately that situation is anything but. But I mean the perfect storm of our president at the time and everything that was happening just really created this huge kind of outpouring for us. And I, I don't think we're going to have that again for a while, which is good. So us as black businesses, we've got to find other ways to kind of grab those customers' attention. So just as an overall thing, and we'll talk about how people can connect with you in just a second, but just as an overall business owner, how would you suggest people do a better job of just supporting black businesses in general? Sometimes you got to look for black businesses, you know, until we have the same type of resources and opportunities that all businesses have. Like sometimes you got to search, but if you do a simple Google search, you'll find things. And even for blacks, it's the same. Like 
know, my husband's like said a while ago, I want to start buying black more. And I said, like, yeah, we need to, right? So everything we go to buy, you know, we had a baby. He Googled black baby companies. And I mean, wow, I had no idea. And now I'm a big drinker. There's a ton of like black liquor companies that are coming about, which I think is so cool. So we have to look, but then we also have to be open to changing our consumer behaviors you know when you've been buying something for years it's natural to continue to buy it but if you don't make changes there will be no change so we have to be that change we want to see and so you got to just make a little extra effort that's all yeah i have to admit part of the impetus for me starting this podcast was because i was looking to buy black more often and i just wasn't finding things that i wanted to buy that were made by black people so i had to go out and look for it yeah yeah, definitely. But kudos to you for doing that, you know? Yeah. And I mean, you know, you, you've got all these lists of different things, but it's tough when it looks like those lists are sort of few and far between. You know, you, you get something on a mainstream outlet that might have, you know, 50 or 200 businesses and that's all well and good. But there's still dozens and hundreds of other businesses out there that you could still be supporting. And there's so many other things, too, that go into it. And honestly, it's such a cycle and why Blacks and Black businesses have just been, like, behind, right, for so long because, you know, we'll do things like we'll buy from a Black business and we'll have a terrible experience, right? Like, it'll take a long time to receive it or something or the customer service wasn't the best. And, like, you know, that's a valid reason, right? That's a valid reason to say, like, cool, I'm done with that business. But we're so quick to be like, you see, we bought Black and look what happened. We're over it. And it's like... It's funny because it's like these other brands do the same things and we still buy from them. Like, you know, I remember during the holidays, I mean, we just got so overwhelmed and uh, we had some issues with our 3PL. And so some people were receiving their packages like a month later and it was terrible. You know, I was emailing every week with these people, apologizing and telling them what was going on, being transparent. And a lot of people were really supportive and they were like, you know, thanks for being so transparent. Most business owners aren't like this. Like, we're grateful. But we definitely have people who, you know, said, like, this is absurd. Like, we ordered our stuff from West Elm last week, and or we got our stuff from Amazon. And I totally wanted to write back and say, do you seriously think we're as big as West Elm? And I know you don't think we're as big as Amazon. You know? Who are you comparing us to? And those were the people I'm thinking, are you just buying black just to buy black? And you're looking for the first reason to say like, oh no, like, you know, we don't have the same resources as Amazon, but are you telling me you've never ordered from Amazon and they've never messed up your order? It happens to me all the time. I get packages with different names on them. I'm like, I didn't order this from Amazon or, you know, it comes differently. Or, you know, I ordered some plates from CB2 over the holidays and I just got them in March. I ordered them for Black Friday and I got a plate in March, but like, honestly, it's not the biggest deal. Like it is what it is. Like they could have canceled it, but it was like 20 bucks. I didn't care. It came and I love the plate. We need to have that type of like empathy for black businesses, especially knowing that they don't have the same resources. They don't have the same capital as some of these other brands and be able to give them another chance. That I feel like is key. That part about the empathy, as I've talked with business owners now, that seems to be a trend. Things didn't go the way that I wanted it to. I still got my product, but you took too long. And people seem to have a short fuse just because they can get a hold of the business owner up front. Yeah, they're harder on us. And it's crazy because, it's, like I said, they're getting abused by other brands, right? It happens. Like, you know, the post office and UPS, anything could happen. It, there's a snowstorm. There was a big nor'easter, I think. And we were telling people and they were like, well, we still got this and we still got. And it's just like, you know what? But if UPS puts out an email and says like, due to the weather, we're behind, everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. But if the business owner tells somebody that, they're not with it. So to your point, it's like people support, but then they also at the same time have this short fuse and it's unacceptable. You, If you're going to support that word, it means more than just I bought. You know, we always are saying that too. Like we have friends who are like, oh, I bought jam from you. Like, yeah, like four years ago. Like if jam's not your thing, totally fine. You can't force it. But what I'm saying is because you buy something once in a lifetime, I don't know if that necessarily means support. What it does mean is that there are other ways you can support. You know, if you buy Smuckers and you think it's okay, but you buy it because it's at the grocery store and you just throw it in your cart, but you know it's bad for you and your kids and you just like whatever, that's the change I'm talking about. You may have to buy my jam. You might have to go to a certain Whole Foods to get it. Or you might have to go online to get it. But you go online to buy everything else. 
So you have to make that extra step to kind of change your lifestyle and make a point to support more than once for these brands that you really do want to help. It's almost like any other lifestyle change. You know, sometimes you have to go out of your way to make sure that that's the lifestyle you want to live. You got to change some things around to make sure that you're getting the results that you want. No, totally. I mean, there's brands that we've stopped using. You know, I think Goya put out like a racist statement and my husband refuses to let me buy Goya products. And it's annoying because Goya has the cheapest beans and I, we eat a lot of beans. And so every time I go to order from our online grocer, I have to search out the other beans from the other brands and they're always like a dollar more. And it's annoying, but I tell you what, I've not bought Goya one time since he said that, but it wasn't that hard. You know, it's a dollar more and who cares? Beans are beans. Like we just found another brand. It's not rocket science and it's not like a very challenging thing. You just have to put some effort behind it. Yeah. And after a while, that change just becomes a habit, just like anything else. It becomes normal. Absolutely. Well, I know time is money for you. I want to uh, sort of point this in the wrapping up direction. So just a couple more questions. Tell me, you know, if anybody is looking for any kind of inspiration or anything like that, do you have any books or podcasts or, or anything else like that that you would recommend people check out? You know, I love how I built this podcast. It's just always like a story about brands like Stacey's Keto Chips or Kate Spade, brands that are huge now. You know, they talk with the owner, they talk about where they started, and I'm pretty sure any business owner can relate. So I think that's a really inspirational and great podcast um, with some good gems. And then books. There's one book that sticks out in particular. Oh gosh, I don't read as much, nearly as much as I would love to anymore. But there's one book that I read and it was called Grace Over Grind. And it really resonated with me because, you know, everyone's all about this like grind culture and like you got to grind. I hear that. If I hear that word again, I'm going to like hurt somebody. But it's all about literally choosing grace over the grind. You know, it's faith based, but it's just great. It's about how like if you stick with your purpose, follow God, talk to God and just really fall into your purpose and hear that and make those moves that you don't have to grind. It doesn't mean you don't have to work hard, but you don't have to use this like grind as a negative term. You know, literally grinding is like something forcefully up against something else. It's not a good positive thing. And it's all about if you just kind of fall into your purpose and do what you're supposed to be doing in the world and do the right thing, that things will fall into place and you won't have to hurt or grind for it. You will just kind of work for it like normal and it'll come, you know, I'm probably butchering it, but it's, it's really great book because it just helps you choose peace in this stressful day-to-day environment. And I think um, everyone needs that, especially entrepreneurs. What is the best way that people can support Trade Street Jam Company? And I say the best way they can really support it that is of interest to you, because I know a whole lot of different people use different platforms to sell things. They take out different commissions and things like that. So what is the best way for you that people can support the business? Yeah, it's our website. Head to our website. It's tradestreetjamco.com, trade, S-T-J-M-C-O. And uh, that's our Instagram handle as well. But head to our website, grab some jam. It makes great gifts with all holidays coming up. They're good birthday gifts. Everyone loves a foodie gift, you know, stop spending your money on something people might not use, you know, when you get a gift and it like goes in that closet or that cabinet and you like never see it again. But everyone loves a food gift. So definitely head there and then head to our Instagram page. Give us a follow. We have so much fun over there. We're doing recipe videos and I'm making cocktails and we're just doing all the things with the jam. So definitely check us out on both of those platforms. I love that. I definitely love that as gifts. I love gifts that disappear after a while and I don't have to keep junk in my house. Right. Absolutely. (laughs) Ashley Rouse, thanks for coming on the Built-in Black America podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, thanks to Ashley Rouse for coming on the Built-in Black America podcast. You can check out Trade Street Jam Company at tradestreetjamco.com. That's trade, S-T, jamco.com. We'll have links to the website and her social media over at builtinblackamerica.com. Folks, if you've made it this far and you haven't subscribed to the Built-in Black America podcast, what are you waiting for? You can find us everywhere you get your podcasts and check us out on social media. The Instagram handle is Built in Black America. On Twitter, it's Black America Pod. And you can find all of our episodes and show notes over at BuiltInBlackAmerica.com. I'm Larry McGill. Thanks for joining me on the journey with the Built in Black America podcast.